Hello, good afternoon. It's so nice to be here with you. Welcome. So uh, my name's Richard Watts and I'll be co-hosting this um, particular session, this reflection session with the um, co-director of Freelance Futures, Jean Lingo. So this event is part of Freelance Futures, a summer programme of learning and action for equitable conditions in culture. And it's being delivered in partnership with the Freelance Futures Consortia, who are all represented here today, I'm delighted to say. Um, so um, I'm a 53 year old white man and I'm wearing clear glasses, I have short hair and I'm sat in front of a red oil painting. Um, and um, before we start, we just need to run through some access and other important information. So this session's being recorded and it will be permanently available to view via our dedicated YouTube channel and via the website um, and community platform. Today, we have my clear text providing live captioning. Judith is with us, thank you, Judith. To access this, please click the closed captions button. Just take a brief pause whilst those who need to activate captioning can do that. BSL interpretation is being provided by interpreters of colour who've been with us all week. And today, Abby and Rachel are joining us and they'll um, alternate every 15 minutes during this session. Thank you so much for all that you've provided this week. So in terms of um, Freelance Futures, it's a call for collective learning and action to build equitable conditions for freelancers working in culture. And it will take all of our efforts to affect real change. So we welcome all your insights and experiences as independent practitioners and practitioners working within cultural organisations, unions, funding bodies and in policy making. Given that we need all of us, this is our basic code of conduct for today. Please respect and value your collaborators in this room. Be aware of your privilege. Know when to make space, when to take space. Avoid overcomplicated language and explain technical terms. Let's recognise we're all at different stages of learning too. So um, respect the person, challenge the idea. You're quite right, um, Jess, someone is standing in the background and I'll, um, I might move rooms in a second. And if this is distracting, let me know in the chat and I'll move somewhere that has perhaps less good Wi-Fi, but less sounding. Um, and it's great to see you in this session, Jess. I feel like you've been a really regular um, contributor to these sessions and to the chat, which has been really welcome. So if you have a question, we will be, um, we will be uh, having a, a conversation together in this hour session, starting with the partners um, who've helped organize the sessions, sharing um, some learning, and then hearing from um, each of you too. Um, if you have questions in the meantime, or want to pop a chat, uh, a comment in the chat, then please do that or let us know that you'd like to speak by raising your hand. Um, so I think the next thing for me is to say, wow, what a week. Um, I'm just delighted to be here with other members of the Freelance Coalition um, that's helped shape and produce freelance futures. We thought we'd hear each other's reflections, gather reflections from you too as we bring this virtual gathering to a close. Of course, this isn't the end of Freelance Futures. It's a nine week, not five day long uh, program for a reason. So we'll also be looking at next steps too in this conversation and asking you about next steps as well. Um, but first of all, we thought it'd be useful to ask three questions of each other. What have we learnt? What actions have caught our imaginations this week? And what do we think we might do next? So from my perspective, um, I feel like some of the things that um, I've learned most um, have been, I guess, about reinforcing a sense of 
how hard it is. Um, how hard it is for freelancers in the cultural sector. There's no doubt about that. Um, so thank you for making this what you chose to do this week. I feel like, okay, I'm going to move. I'm getting a note to say that that background noise is getting a little bit too noisy. So um, I'm just gonna move spaces, sit outside. Hope that's okay. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. I, I think that's better, isn't it? So, um, yeah, certainly a, re a sense of reinforcing a sense of what's hard. Uh, thank you for making this what you chose to do this week. I think I also got a real sense that um, we need to invest in our freelance community um, and that we all need to, and that that's hard. <laughs> um, but the, the space, the distance and collective experience have really enabled us all to hear insights and to reframe um, some of our experience during this week, which feels really important. Notice that going on. I also noticed like my, one of my areas of interest is in organizational change. And one of the things I've really noticed is that it's not harder or more expensive to do better in this area. You know, if we're thinking about transparency and listening and shifting our culture, it's not more expensive to do that less well. And so there's not a distinction of resources in who's creating more equitable conditions, just clarity commitment and listening so you know Scottish Sculpture Workshop and Glyndebourne you know diversity and arc you know their scales are very different but what they demonstrated was that clarity commitment and listening have created better conditions or equitable conditions for with by freelancers and that bringing our mission into alignment with how we're treating people we're working with isn't too much to ask and that that's what I think we as freelancers might be asking of organizations that we work with. Recognizing that many people are sometimes freelancers, even those who have paid roles in organizations. The other thing I wanted to notice was about clarity and like just clarity of voice and contribution. I feel like it's really hard to pick who to ref reference, but, you know, Vijay Patel, Jack Tan, Laura Naihu. Uh, when people are clear, it's really heard, right? And we can amplify what we heard. It speaks to us. Um, yeah, so I think that for me, those are some of the things I've really learned and noticed during the week. And when I think about actions that have really caught my imagination, They've been about riders, VJ and Johnny Cotson, Ruth Gard also talking about values riders. They've been about organizational commitments, uh, uh, spark arts and arcs, um, policies for the employment of freelancers. Um, you know, it feels like there's some really clear um, uh, definite things we could we could take steps to do. And then when I think about things we're gonna do as a result of today, I think we're gonna convene internally and people make it work as a community of freelancers. We're going to convene to develop personal riders for everyone. I, I'm sure that's something we'll end up doing. Of course, we need to decide this together, but my sense is we'll also increase trans transparency and clarity of briefs when we're working with our freelance colleagues that will consolidate and track our care budget more clearly and will make more transparent what people can ask for in terms of space, advances, personalised payment terms. I just throw that out there more clearly. And externally, I think we're going to proactively engage organisations we work with, with what we've been hearing in freelance futures. And I think the other thing we're going to do is create... Um, equitable some kind of equitable conditions a to z from what we've heard with examples and links where they exist like i feel like that's like just about kind of 
uh, hoovering that up, consolidating it. And finally, I think there's something about supporting self-organizing with allyship, convening space and amplification that um, we will want to do as a result of today. There's about 2,300 people who've um, signed up to the uh, email newsletter. 1,580 people have attended sessions so far this week. And about twice as many people have accessed recordings as have attended some sessions. And some of those recordings are only just coming up online. There are 140 downloads of the Organizational Change Toolkit. 790 people have joined the Mighty Network. So I feel like there's something that isn't finished about this conversation that's exciting. Thanks for bearing with me as I navigated what's going on in, our, in my home today. And I'm now going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to share his reflections next. And then I think we're going to hand from person to person before June Lin then invites comments from the rest of the group. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Watts. I'm the artistic director and founder of Max Musician and Artist Exchange. I am a 54-year-old white male wearing glasses with shoulder length, brown hair and an orange t-shirt, orange shirt rather, sitting in a vestry of a church in Bethnal Green. It's kind of cool in here. It's not so as hot as some of you are finding. There's no need for sun cream inside here. Um, I wanted to start by saying I have been in complete awe this week um, and have been allowed to give myself permission for the biggie for me is actually to listen and to listen to what everybody's had to say and the way in which people are taking the bull by the horns and standing up for what they believe in and giving themselves their own voice and progressing with that. And I've, I think that there's this permission thing, we tend to have a view and then someone challenges it and we go, yeah, whatever, but my view is this. And I've heard so many fascinating stories from the freelance community that makes me feel, A, very proud to be a freelancer, but also very proud to admit that actually I know nothing and I'm still learning, I'm still trying to take advice from people and hear this language and think, wow, I've never thought about it in that way. Um, certainly in meetings before the live events, I, I was on a very steep learning curve. And I have to say, as I said to my colleagues, thank you so much for just keep bringing your witness to the table. And actually from the conversations I've had with people who've attended this symposium, I've learned that actually there are so many people who share the same linguistics. We just need to get our linguistic ducks in a row, as it were, and to go forth and spread the message of, of how we see our freelance life, how we see our, our way forward, and that many, many different ideas actually are producing the same direction. We all want to find this super, super family. And I think it is a community and family which I'm bowled over, certainly, in my job as an opera singer, you tend to stand out the front of an orchestra by yourself. And I talk about it in a way of being lonely in a crowd. And I have to say within this week, I have not been lonely at all. I have found friends and people I've never met before who we've had email contact and conversations and wouldn't be nice to do this and let's talk about this. So thank you for the, the big thing for me learning is, is this being able to listen, to be able to really feel part of a community and part of a process, which I think is, as Richard has said, is just the starting point rather than, uh, you know, the end, we have all the answers. No, we don't, we have, we've thrown our, our things on the picnic of joy and we're going to say, right, what should we take now? Um, I suppose that takes me on to number two, the actions that have caught my imagination, working conditions, pay, the idea of that, I've never thought and the, the sort of overriding way in which this has all been explained with such kindness and humility, which again is something within the freelance world and organizations that sometimes is a little lacking as we're all trying to get on with what we're trying to do to, to prove our, our worth, I suppose, in a funny sort of thing. 
And my, the idea of what I want to do next is I just want to understand what I do a bit better from certainly a running an organization point of view. I want to feel that I'm, I'm able to be more open to allow people to talk to me without feeling I'm being attacked which is a, a personal growth thing. And I've, I've watched people interact. I've interacted with people and thought, wow, you can have a conversation because you have a different point of view, but your journey where you want to end up, your direction of flow is the same journey. Um, and I've learned that I really want to invest in everybody I come into contact with. I mean, that's probably completely impossible, but even if it's just invest a small part of my brain or invest in just hearing them. I think that's the big thing. My ears have been opened, they've been de-waxed and I feel in a really, really good place. Uh, so those are my reflections and uh, thanks for my ramblings. And I hand on to, I haven't got my list in front of me. Who do I hand on to? Ray, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, so my name is Ray Dosage. I'm the head of training and client services at Incarts. Um, I'm a brown woman with from South Asian heritage. Um, I'm in my early 40s. I've got uh, black shoulder length hair with a fringe and I'm wearing black rimmed glasses and a pretty bright blue top um, and I'm sat in front of a light green background. Um, so in carts and our sort of remit within the sector is, is to champion the, the creative, contractual and economic rights of the UK's African, Asian, Caribbean and ethnically diverse um, workforce, essentially. And that obviously includes um, freelancers within that absolutely, you know, want to advocate for, for how we can support global majority freelancers and our, our remit is to to make inclusive change within the arts and cultural sector so you know it's a it's about making the sector thrive and 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 allowing a um you know work in the arts to be not about privilege and, and allowing access for everyone and trying to make that that equitable um pipeline for people um and that's really been the the theme of of uh, the symposium you know it's that that equitable change and, and for me, what I've learned, there's been some real listening, as, as Andrew mentioned, you know, a chance to really hear uh, freelancers um, and, and to touch on also what Richard said, actually, equitable change is, is not where we need it to be. It's not where we want it to be. But actually, there are some really great actions happening across the industry. Um, but what I think it's really important to understand and, and think about is that change in the industry can't happen in instantly it's not going to be um something that happens straight away um it will take time to implement a lot of the ideas in the discussions that we've been having but i i really think that it's been um a really good chance um for people to uh not work in silo actually i think we all have a tendency to to really sort of just get heads down and do what we do and, and work alone um, and, and work in silo. And I think the symposium has been a really great opportunity um, for us to come together and to share. And actually sharing is part of that key, you know, it's really key to making sustainable change in, in the industry, in the sector. So, um, and the conversations around tearing down power, taking action to involve freelancers in positions of influence really spoke to me. You know, the, the, the topic of giving freelancers agency and the space to contribute is, is vital and, and ultimately enriching for all. So it was great to um, hear some of the actions and frameworks, networks that people are already putting in place. Um, and some of those um, are being done with little to no budget as well. You know, we are a creative sector and, and we, we really, you know, a lot of organisations are really tapping into that creativity, um, especially when budgets are tight. So, you know, I, I also really enjoyed the well-being support that um, that was in place, you know, with the, the, the sort of dance breaks or the um, and the well-being sessions. And, and I'll definitely be tapping into some of those techniques and, and actually sharing those in the sessions that I run um, within, within the industry to, to promote well-being. Um, and in terms of actions that have uh, caught my imagination, I, I think the need for crafting a welcome for freelancers is so important actually, whether that, you know, be meet and greet, you know, open door meetings, whether a code of conduct, whatever that looks like, actually, it's about fostering relationships and, and creating a culture for sharing. Um, 
And and for me, the stories and sharing around, excuse me, around intersectional approaches have also really caught my imagination. I think that's really at the heart of a a truly inclusive and equitable sector. Um, So the changes that are taking place to support, protect, welcome, engage with marginalised freelancers and have their voices in the room and at the table is is really the foundation to, to shaping this deep change as well. And in terms of what, what's next, what happens next, um, for, for Incarts, um, certainly as, a, as an organisation, we are already, uh, you know, trying to make deep change in the sector. So it's about continuing and building on the changes that we are already working on. You know, we want to support the sector to understand the value of freelancers and, and predominantly for us, global majority freelancers um, and, and support them to create meaningful, inclusive work. Um, I think it's really important to continue for us to spread the word around well-being and mental health support um, and and what is available for freelancers and and global majority freelancers. A lot of panellists actually mentioned about the the person-centric approach um, and part of creating equitable structures can mean that it can take a toll on marginalised people, um, especially if they have lived experience of racism, for example. So you know, we, we recognise that the toll that it can take on people's mental health. And whilst there is work to be done to create a truly equitable um, and in our, in our eyes, a truly anti-racist sector, the well-being and mental health support is really vital to protecting marginalised people and freelancers, as, as Andrew mentioned, you know, who, who sometimes do really feel alone in the work that they do. Um, another strand of our organisation is research um, within our business. So there's certainly opportunities for us to be able to interrogate further um, how freelancers are a vital part of the ecosystem of the arts. But the analysis around is this landscape changing? How is it changing? How quickly is it changing? Um, thoughts and opportunities for global majority freelancers. What do they look like? Um and, and, and what that pipeline of work and support also looks like. So um, that commitment to, um, you know, interrogating that landscape is really vital for us. And, and also our commitment to um, continuing um, free resources for the sector, right? Because actually there's there's got to be um, something, some, some things that are available in order to continue and drive the shift in the sector and we want to we want to work more collaboratively with global majority freelancers so they can feed into this and we can actually you know really build more of a more of a framework that is that is inclusive uh for 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 all um whether it be organizations who are employing freelancers whether it's freelancers sort of looking to um you know change their practice um so yes we really want to sort of make that shift within the sector Thank you. Now, who's next? Ah, Claire, thank you. (laughs) Thanks, Ray. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Claire Thurman. I'm the National Movement Lead with What Next and the Director of Learning and Communities at People Make It Work. I'm a white woman with a dark brown bob, a fringe and glasses, and I have a guitar hanging on the wall behind me. Um, So what have we learned? Well, um, many, many things. Um, But one thing I've picked up on is a real sense of solidarity and empowerment in freelancers coming together. And that may sound quite simple, but at the same time, I've experienced its power over the course of this week. Um, There's been a sense that the community has inspired people to take action individually at the same time. And that if that happens, for example, around the way we enter into conversations with organisations, then things like riders around access and value will become commonplace. They will become the norm. And there seems to be um, a sense of of empowerment in that. Um, Something that I heard just this morning, which I loved from an organisation perspective, was around not just being open to freelancers being part of the organisation, but actively welcoming and supporting a freelance community um, to work collaboratively with organizations, this real sense of co-creation and working together. Um, I think there've been some really inspiring practical ideas, lots of resources, links shared by speakers, by everyone in the community. 
um, things around the riders that I've mentioned, access and values, understanding and really hearing experiences of working with unions um, and approaching governance differently, a whole kind of mindset shift around governance um, and what that can mean for freelancers and the community. Um, so there've been loads of brilliant conversations. Um, many feel like they're just beginning, as we've, we've all said, and there are still some big outstanding issues and questions which we absolutely welcome. Um, and I think that we want to commit to helping to continue these across the What Next movement and beyond. Um, so from a What Next point of view, our key strands and areas of focus include convening, learning and modelling, advocacy and amplification. And all of these areas apply to how we listen to, collaborate and support freelancers. So we want to carry on having a better kind of conversation with everyone in the ecology and enable each other's views to be heard in an equitable way. Um, so I think we really want to engage the whole workforce in the thinking around how we do this most effectively. Um, we're going through our own development at the moment as a movement at What Next and thinking about how we continue to build the movement better. So we're looking at our resourcing and how we organise. And a huge part of this development has been about access, inclusion and creating equitable spaces. And I feel like our commitment for that has further been reinforced by this symposium and by everything that we've heard. Um, we're a team of freelancers ourselves, um, and I think there's always things to consider around how we approach engagements with other freelancers, how we listen, and how we really act on our commitment to working a, in a collaborative and transparent way. Um, and I guess on that, I would say there is always more work to do. We can always do more. Um, we, for, for a while now, we've sort of been toying with this belief that we're constantly testing and that's the conversation needs to change. We're still trialing that, we're still experimenting and figuring out different ways of, of um, testing and, and seeing where that happens. And I think, again, this symposium has been a great opportunity to build on how we do that and to continue to learn about what works um, in terms of convening, having conversations and, and the, the development of that into real action and change. Um, so I, I would just finish by saying onwards, really onwards. Um, and we, we want to really, you know, kind of take this work further forward. Um, let's have more of this and let's use this moment of connections and ideas to move firmly into a space of action and solutions. And I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Tracy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tracy Gentles. I am the Creative Director CEO of Something to Aim For, which is also known as Staff. I'm a brown skinned person with short brown hair, wearing thick rimmed glasses and a stripy top. I'm sat in front of a white bookshelf uh, with a picture frame and plant on top. There are post sticks to my uh, one side and blinds to the other. My pronouns are she, her. I found this really difficult today to think about how to round things down because I think the overriding learning which other people have picked on is that this is a conversation that has just started, unfortunately, and I know that people want change now, but it's a long-term conversation and commitment. Um, and staff, um, as I know the colleagues here, are all 100% are behind that commitment to change. I found listening uh, really difficult this week because I think listening when you're overwhelmed is difficult and I have at times been overwhelmed by the conversations, but I really look forward to re-listening and embedding the learning. Um, I just wanted to share something sort of external that's been coming back to me, which was a talk a while ago, um, just after the pandemic about work and utopia, um, which was by, Zab D'Souza, who was part of the pay rates talk and uh, uh, Professor Jerry Hanlon, who's an academic working in the business school at Queen Mary's. Basically, they were talking in this event about the arts worker being benchmarked as the perfect worker by other sectors, because we will work under really bad conditions with a smile on our face and continue to work like that. 
And I think it's it, this has been really interesting. It's it keeps kept kept coming back because I think there is a change happening now. I think that people are no longer willing to work in these conditions. And previously, we have actually continued to work. I mean, we're all still here, and it is very very difficult. Um, I think two takeaways that I have um, are there's loads of great thinking and evidence that's been built, especially over the last two years, about how we can better support, how we can restructure things. I think there is a gap between some of this amazing thinking and action. And I think that actually bringing together activators, freelancers are a lot of them activators in those solutions would be a really great outcome. Um, and we're up for facilitating that in whatever way we can. Um, I think it's really worth pointing out that there are still freelancers that are falling through the gaps of support. Um, so we really need to actively be listening to those quiet uh, voices or really loud voices that are really difficult because these are the people that we need to bring along the, with this journey and we need to signpost better. I think a call to action for the sector is that we should all be signposting each other's work in a much better way. And I hope that this can be a starting point for that. So uh, actions that have caught my imagination. I just wanted to talk about, it wasn't this week, it was actually just at the end of last week. It was the data collection, collecting, which I just wanted to bring into the frame of this week because I, I just thought that that talk and the spread. So people were talking about approaches to collecting data and there was all sorts of perspectives and it was such a rich conversation about how, you know, da data from an academic uh, perspective, how it's building, you know, my career-based way or, it, but there's also like the reaction, reactions to communities, marginalized communities about data collection. And a lot of that information that we're trying to collect is also mechanisms for change, but there is a lot of data already like collected. And I think going back to what I said before, the activation, how can we activate what we know already rather than having the same conversation about the same change over and over again? I think that's what I'm really, really, I, I kind of have to make that happen in order for someone like me to enter the sector or to sustain a career in the sector. Um, so there's lots more to do. Those are the things that really um, have been kind of playing in my mind. And I hope that idea of the arts work of being benchmarked because we'll continue to work in this way is something that is of the past. So what are we doing at staff? So we have built a lot of the conversational spaces around research that we've been engaged in and with members of the sector around race and class as exclusionary factors. And this week, um, we look to really activate that research and really think about how we can start celebrating new models. Like how can we look at these amazing things that are happening and give them the limelight? And sometimes those are coming from the margins um, of, of the sector. So I think um, what we're doing with that research is now activating it. So we are opening up a mentoring program and I was it was really great that mentoring was me mentioned in lots of spaces. And I know Andrew at Max is also doing the same. And it's, and it's how we can join the dots and make sure that there is, there is that foundational support of like when people need to access the sector, like it all retain and survive in the sector, mentoring and coaching are like, have been identified as, as, as necessary, but if they're necessary for access and inclusion, why are we not resourcing them? Why are people doing this for free? Because then it also creates a loop of marginalization because only people who can afford to mentor, mentor. So I think that these are the things that I'm really interested in championing. I've also got a little public health <laughs> announcement on the Edinburgh Fringe. And I'm gonna mention this because it's the Edinburgh Fringe Society are, our, are one of our strategic partners and have just launched a new strategy, which sounds fantastic. It's all about access and inclusion and foregrounding that. However, as we've said before, change doesn't happen overnight. And it is one of the most difficult spaces to present and show your work. And I would, I would really ask people if they know people going to the sector, if they can support, if they, if they can support in terms of advice, that, that holding. I, I really am worried about there being a, a collapse within a mental health collapse around the Edinburgh Fringe. And I think that I just have to say that while we might have some energy in this space. So um, finding ways to open up and champion, all of these things I've talked about, but also critically 
I think what we're really interested in staff is opening up spaces where what, what we've been calling like practical dreaming or blue sky spaces. I do feel like the trauma of working through the pandemic is real <laughs> and I think that sometimes I'm not really sure what sector I work in and I think it's really important that we do continue to open spaces up for people to dream to, to dream practically but also to to blue sky think and I think out of our research one of the things is some people get to do that all the time and some people do not get to do that and I think that whoever we're giving these opportunities to we, would, we just really need to think about how we're opening up those spaces those are my rambling thoughts, um, but thank you very much. Over to Emma Jane. Emma Jane speaking. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I'm Emma Jane or EJ. I'm white, femme presenting in my mid thirties, wearing a plain white t-shirt with blonde bangs, large gold earrings and gold rim glasses with a little black frame detail on top and I am a freelancer who volunteers with Freelancers Make Theatre Work, which very much means we're linked to others by a value statement and a drive for change. But when I'm here, I'm very much speaking as myself on the panel and can only speak for myself as someone who works with Freelancers Make Theatre Work and has been involved in this process. And my aim would be to keep my contribution as short as possible because what I'm permanently learning and relearning is that I don't find spaces of listening to people who have been centered because they have some form of power conducive to my own concentration or to moving towards action. And I'm much greater served in my nature by dialogue doing directness and being in spaces where there is no social code around how it's all been done before. And so I'm really relieved and grateful. Thank you, Tracy, for your contribution. Because um, I'm also a bit thrown today because I've just read an article in the stage where Dad and Henley, CBE and Chief Exec of Arts Council England, focuses on the impact of the cost of living crisis on the running of buildings um, and absolutely failed to mention the workforce anywhere. And again, it leaves me learning and relearning that the talk is tiring and that the platitudes and the promises are endless, but the appetite to shift the, the whole culture of our work in the monumental way that I really believe is required still feels really distant. And I hear Richard when he says it's not hard to do better in this area, but I wonder how that can be the case when we're still stuck in a place of just asking for discussion, consideration and visibility, um, just visibility, not even change, whilst what is demanded of us repeatedly is resilience and palatability and really fucking hard work. And I, ugh, I'm angry because I'm tired, because it's, it's a circle I've seen many times. And I wondered about action relative to freelance futures and how we possibly could have been clearer in stating the actions we may have been hoping for. And I think I work as a movement director and there's a, this lovely curious moment between the script and table work and then the first day of rehearsals where things are going to get on their feet um, and it's really hard to lift a script off the page and it's messy and it's clumsy and it's normally a bit shit to start with because our bodies don't know what to do because we've been talking so much we cut ourselves off at the neck and forget we're physical beings um, and I wonder if that's the stage we as a sector are at in all of this. We need to get the words off the page so urgently, but I'm not sure we are actually truly ready to collectively feel clumsy and messy and to let ourselves be a bit shit so that we can then get to the really good and juicy stuff. And I do think it is telling that the numbers for this session are significantly lower than some of the other sessions I've been to, because I'm wondering who still has an appetite to talk about talking. <laughs> like, do we just want to be doing? So in terms of my next steps, I'm going to continue curating the panel about activism that will happen on Tuesdays and ways to be an activist and think really clearly about communicating the action that that session aims to drive. Overall, I will continue to turn up whilst simultaneously wondering if the reason I'm tired is because I've been turning up for over a decade. So in brutal truth, I no longer find this kind of gathering inspiring. 
I often find it repetitive, stagnant and frustrating because inspiration enough, like inspiration alone, cannot maintain a life or a person. And if it did, I wouldn't need to ask for fees or workers' rights in the first place. I'd just be living my best life on good chat and vibes, being inspired. Um, And on a smaller scale today, which we can, as someone whose work is about creating narratives and subtext, I'm going to challenge the language of rider that keeps cropping up. And in the in the contemporary context, I would say a rider has a specific suggestion, and I would like to say we're not divas. It's not about pizza and specifically coloured M and M's before a gig. We're asking for really basic workers' rights. Some of us are asking to not be discriminated against for advocating for the simplest, and when I say simplest, I mean it's simplest version of equity possible. Other sectors don't have riders. They have contracts, workers' protections, and layers of dignity enshrined in law. And that's what I want. And I want us all to refuse anything less, because as we hope and we talk about slow change, um, there are some people, and often the people with the most precarious lives, who are currently being exploited in this second today. They're being exploited, burnt out, and broken by design because the infrastructure is designed to do that. If we are tired, we cannot fight for better conditions. So the system will exhaust us. We don't need riders to challenge this. We need rights and we need to have the confidence to walk away from the table when any of us, even if it is just one of us, is offered anything less. And that's the action I will be taking for the rest of forever. I'm gonna walk away if not every single person I'm in that room with has the rights that they deserve. And I'd really invite you all to do the same. And I'll make the tea if we do and wash the cups as well. Um, And with that, I'll pass on to Jean Lynn. Thank you so much, Emma Jane. Thanks to everyone. I'm really hearing all the emotions um, in the room. And it's been a long week on multiple fronts and scales. We've had some wins this week, uh, this week, politically, um, but it's it's been a hard week, um, and I hear everything that has been said. Um, I think what I have learned from this week is that to again state the obvious, there is no one top dog, no top solution that will speak for us all. Um, Everything we do matters, whether it is um, artistic making, research, governance, human resources, um, because this is all about power, um, power that's structured within particular histories and particular policies that determine who is centered and who's marginalized. So I think whatever we do in the making and supporting of um, art and culture is meaningful and our spaces to uh, make change. Um, I reiterate Anik Matifia's point, which Tracy picked up, we know enough and what EJ has said, data is a mirage and the lack of data is used to excuse the status quo. We don't lack data, we have enough data, and what we have is biased and criminalizes and traumatizes. So again, that question is about activation. I think we are all on different journeys. And so some of us may be in certain spaces, um, new to things, frustrated by things, um, privileged by things. So we have to acknowledge we're all in really different spaces. So what I've really taken from a lot of the most supportive stuff of this week is how can we uplift one another wherever we are and to really recognize each other's contributions, to celebrate each other's efforts and our attempts rather than to um, be ungenerous. And I don't think that's some Uh, conscious most of that time I think we want better so we're frustrated or um, we criticize because we're uh, being trained to become perfectionists Um, but um, it was really useful when Zara Ash Harper I think she was in the manifesting session 
uh, uh, she said, we judge ourselves by our intentions, um, and but others by their impact. And I think that's interesting. So <laughs> how can we be more generous to one another? Um, in the leadership, leading differently uh, session, Laura Krasteva said, um, which I think is a really beautiful uh, description of leadership, that leadership is communicating people's worth so clearly that they're inspired to see it in themselves. Um, so we do think uh, and inspire differently. So how do we celebrate that ecology? And how can we be very, very intentional about the touch points, the touchstones of why we're here and what we do and who we do it alongside. And I think that includes where we place our energy, where we take ourselves out of what we center and what we decenter. And I think that is all crucial, intentional strategy and tactics that also crucially supports our mental health and our sustainable um, choice about where we put ourselves. Um, I really believe in bringing um, a full creative ethos into what we're doing. So investing the trying out, the testing out, the failing, the learning, the exploring. Um, and I think in the conversation we had on governance, um, I think that was a really uh, nice like example of practitioners looking at how to experiment with building different infrastructures or intervening into existing structures with uh, proactive ways of shifting and transforming them. So Marina Norris um, from Brighton talked about really, let's just reject the fact that governance is static. Let's acknowledge that governance is something that has to evolve and adapt to the needs of the moment, that governance is a process. Um, and Jack Keetan talked about why are we taking governance from these inherited colonial patriarchal ableist models? Why are we not looking at our own mediums that we work in? So he gave an example of if you're a sculptural organization, why don't we look at governance models that come from the practices of molding, forming, blacksmithing, bronze casting that maybe make more sense than something inherited from a different field? So really owning the mediums and the structures in which we work in and that which can better support us. Um, and what EJ was speaking about, you know, us <laughs> literally on Zoom being out there here. Um, and I, I really, I actually had a breakthrough um, in the astrology session with Madeleine Delabotte. Um, and I found that I was able to like really synthesize some of the questions I had about my practice via some of the um, visualizing tools um, of calendars and tarot cards that Rosalie Schweiker and Sajan Kuna um, provided in, in the Arts for Life. And it, it's this sort of stuff. So how are we creating cultures, processes, structures that bring in our own mediums? And yeah, being in my full body, in my full imagination, in my Pisces depth of spiritual knowledge and wisdom, I found something there. <laughs> um, and then I, I just wanted to just um, touch on that question of that has come out as a tension in, in this conversation about ease of change and um, difficulty of change. And I think, it's not to say that things shouldn't be free, cheap, or easy to do, because some things are, um, but some things aren't. And resource is capacity, and resource is vital, especially for marginalized leadership to make those transformative changes that we need. So I, I don't think it's about uh, a scarcity of resources. I think it's about really us being very intentional and changing the priorities of how those resources are redistributed. Um, and it's just about redistribution. We have the money there. Um, I think that's it. I, I know if other people were around, they would definitely talk about pay rates as well. Um, and I was really 
shocked by a colleague saying that they were charging a pay rate that was benchmarked in the 1980s. So I think it's dire, our situation. Um, and coming back to what next and what Claire was saying, it involves us all and us all having a better conversation and activating that conversation together. So those are some of my thoughts. Um, I'm currently on my iPhone, so I can't see the messages uh, and uh, chats as well. I'm wondering, Richard, if you can see if there's any questions there. Um, it might be slightly easier for, um, for you to look through the chat box. Thanks, Julian. Um, I don't see questions, I see a really broad range of comments and perspectives, but I do see that Paul Farrelly has his hand up. So perhaps, Paul, would you like to speak? Oh, shall I just take my hand down so it doesn't stay up uh, all day? Whoops, sorry. I've switched screens. Hello, uh, my name is um, Paul, Paul Farrelly. I am a, um, uh, to follow the convention, a white um, English man, thankfully with an Irish passport, uh, sitting in a yellow room, which my son will reclaim when I pick him up from university this weekend. And I'm wearing what looked like a pair of pound glasses, but I'm told they're very focals. Um, I, was, um, I was a member of parliament for, uh, uh, for the Labour Party uh, until standing down in 2019 and spent um, practically 15 years on the uh, DCMS Select Committee. And over COVID in uh, particular, uh, I've been working with uh, writers and authors and other creative uh, uh, unions, copyright societies, um, to try and get um, freelance or organizations in particular to speak together with one voice, um, falling through the gaps was mentioned earlier by Tracy, uh, and to get a better hearing in, in, in government. Uh, I, I was a journalist before and uh, uh, I'm a freelance now and I've just finished um, editing a book this week. So my question is more specific. Uh, I haven't been able to attend all your sessions, so I just thought it'd be quite useful to come to this roundup. Um, my, my question is really uh, whether during the course of uh, this week and the last few weeks, you've taken any evidence from people as regards their experience of Arts Council England um, uh, programmes, in particular, uh, for instance, developing new, new creative practice and how freelancers are uh, able to access, access grants. Um, we've, we've got a Let's Create strategy and uh, Darren Henley at the Arts Council has, uh, over the last uh, year, or, year or so, you know, explicitly recognised the needs of freelancers, but the question is what is being done in practice to enable people uh, working on their own with good projects to be able to get a, a more equitable share of help than just venues, uh, where it seems that the trickle up down effect is, is not as great as, uh, as it should be. Thanks, Paul. Um, can I see whether at this stage in the conversation, if there's any other comments that people want to make or questions that they want to ask? And then gather those and see if there's any um, member of the organising group that wants to respond. Any other uh, observations or questions that people might have in these last few minutes before I check? Doesn't look like it, okay. So in that case, let's dedicate the last couple of minutes to the question that Paul has raised, which I guess, um, uh, is there anyone that would like to respond to that from the speakers that we heard earlier? Who is, please feel free to end, end. EJ. EJ speaking. Um, context, I live on the Scottish border. So I'm in this really interesting place where I experience culture as it is devolved in Scotland and as it exists in England <laughs> and move between several systems. And I think one of the through lines is that I noticed you said that, you know, where the trickle down effect is not as great as it should be. I think we need to bust the myth of the trickle down effect 
economically, it does not actually work. In practice, it does not actually work. Um, and so for me, there's like an infrastructural imagining, reimagining that needs to happen. We, we acknowledge what is now. I must have graduated like 15 years ago. And I think there was an infrastructure that was largely organisational and um, buildings based. But in the new Labour years, some idiot ran around and told everyone that they were entitled to do this, um, which was great because that's why someone like me ended up being here. And then there was no system for supporting that when funds moved away and when we hit a recession. And I think there needs to be some kind of consideration around all of these strategies about what they look like at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday because they're still just very big words with big aims that aren't being, I think, activated was the word earlier, <laughs> or actioned. And it actually leads me to Madeline's comment in the chat about where do people go to get the training and learning they need to be a freelancer? And I think my worry would be, or my question is, if the system requires people to have to go to train to understand the system enough to exist it, should we provide that training or do we need a better system? Like, do we act, do we need people in school to be being educated on managing finances in a basic way and basic budget management? And do we need an art system where you don't have to be a jargon speaking um, game player <laughs> to actually be involved? Because that's the bit for me, Paul, that's the clunk, is I, I need to be trained to be able to play the game of subsidy. Thanks. And I think those steps are actually what is wholly inappropriate. And if we continue trying to repair those, we're never going to solve the root of the problem, which is that things just shouldn't be as complex or bureaucratic in the first place. Yeah, I, I, if I may, I, I, I think... Paul, um, I, Paul I'm sorry. I, yeah. I don't think we have time, to be honest, for um, a, a forward and back conversation because we're coming up to the end of this session in about... 30 seconds so, so what, we can the arts a, council do better for freelancers is, is the question yeah let's so we do have a place for the, this is an ongoing conversation for sure and we do have a place for some interactive dialogue which is our mighty networks yes, platform yes. if you go to our website click on community exactly these conversations are happening already there's there's, um, there's 790 people in that space and it, it it's certain that we haven't either sought to or heard the solutions we're certainly in a space of uh, exploring and hearing people's uh, complex and difficult experiences of um, working in arts and culture I'm going to have to ask June Lynn to um, close this session. So I'm going to hand over to you, Jay. If that's okay. Thanks ever so much to both Paul and EJ for that brilliant, quick uh, finals uh, comment. Yeah, and a very uh, relevant question that I think is going to um, uh, continue in a different platform. Um, so to close, this has been like the final session of our opening or our online gathering. We still have several weeks left and the invitation for the next few weeks is to really reflect on um, and think about what actions we want to take together um, and individually. Um, so in the next two weeks or three weeks, there'll be sessions on activism, on collective reflection, on programming your own session on um, the community platform that Richard was talking about with ideas and actions that you may want to refine, discuss and build with others. Um, and the rest, uh, the vast majority of all these sessions are being recorded, captioned, interpreted and will be made available um, or permanently on our website, uh, YouTube channel, and the community platform. So we hope this is a midway point of digestion and that the reflection and the building of actions continue over the next few weeks. So thank you so much for everyone's time today.